Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Benjamin, and welcome to part, what is this, 19 for our Godot Action RPG series. In this video, we're going to be solving a problem that we have where if you have two bats uh, that are chasing you like this, they can end up overlapping each other, and it looks like there's only one bat here because there's no real way for them to collide with each other. So we're going to be implementing a soft collision system into this and it's a system that I used back in my game maker days when I was using game maker all the time and it works in Godot as well so we're going to start by creating a new node it's going to be an area 2d and this is going to be our soft collision component we'll just call it soft collision and we'll give it a, sh a collision shape. And we'll save this in overlap. We can save it well. Yeah, I guess that's a good spot to save it. It makes sense to save it there. And we'll attach a script to it. It'll be called softcollision.gd and we'll come into here. And basically, the only thing this needs to do is it needs to detect whether it's overlapping something and then get a push vector. So a vector that goes, that kind of pushes away from anything that it's colliding with. And so we can use that push vector to move our bats outside. If they're overlapping each other, we can push away. They, they'll push away from each other and move away from each other. So we'll make an is colliding. And the way we can tell whether or not this is colliding is if you come into your area 2D right here, you can see we have some different me methods here. And we have a git overlapping areas right here and a git overlapping bodies right here. And these return an array. So obviously they return all of the areas that you're overlapping with or all of the bodies that you're overlapping with. And so we can use that right here to determine if we're colliding with something. So var areas equals git overlapping areas return areas.size is greater than zero. So if we'll, we'll get the overlapping areas and this, this will be an array and if that array's size is greater than zero, then we're colliding with something, so we return true. Otherwise, it'll return false. Now we can make our git push vector function here. We'll say var areas equals git overlapping areas. We'll get the overlapping areas again. We'll create a push vector variable here. We'll just set it equal to vector zero for now vector two dot zero. And then we can check to see if, you could call is colliding here again, actually. Uh, and we might, we might do that, we could do that. If is colliding right here, then we can do var area equals areas zero. Oh, we got a, oh yeah, that's right. Area zero. So what we're going to do, we're going to get the first area that we're colliding with and we're going to ignore the others. And that actually seems to work pretty well. And it helps optimize it a little bit. So we're not looping through every single area that we're colliding with. We're only worried about one of them. And even though we're only getting one of them, uh, it, it, it happens often enough that we're able to account for that anyways. So if we're, if we're colliding with two areas, we'll move away from one of them, but then they'll also move away from each other. And so it works out in the end. So our push vector will be equal to area.globalPosition. And that's the area that we're colliding with, right? It's global position, direction, two, our global position. So it's basically we're getting a vector that goes from its position to our position. So that's, that's um, let's open up paint.net here again. I can show you. So here's us, 
here's them, we're going to get this vector right here. Because that's the direction we want to move in, right? If we're right here, and they're right here, and we're overlapping, we want to move in this direction to move outside of, outside of that collision so that we're no longer overlapping. But we want to normalize that push vector. So push vector equals push vector dot normalized. Which, once again, our vector math here, will take that vector and make it a length of 1, whatever that is. And then we can multiply it by however fast we want to move away from the other enemy. And then we can just return our push vector. So tab back here and do return push vector. So this will return 0 if we're not colliding with anything, right? We might check is colliding up here. So we could actually do this. No, let's just leave it this way. We'll leave it this way. Okay, so now we have our soft collisions. Let's come into our bat right here. Come into the bat. And we'll add a soft collision to our bat. Oh, the other thing we need to do actually, before I forget, is come into our project settings and we need to set up a physics layer for soft collisions. That way they don't collide with everything else in the game. Come into your soft collisions and we'll set it to be both the layer that it's on, wait, which layer is this? Soft collisions, and the layer that it's looking to. It's gonna be both. Okay, save. Then we come into our bat, we can instance a soft collision on the bat like this. And we need to set up its collision shape. And we're gonna use right at the base here, right down here. So we'll do editable children, make a new little circle and shrink it down so that it's pretty small. Doesn't have to be very big. You can make it whatever size you really want to. And we're going to actually hide a bunch of our lighters here. Because they're starting to get a little bit distracting in our editor. And just hide them all and save. Now we can come into the bat and we can use those functions that we just created in order to move the bat. Because all those functions do is they get whether or not the bat is colliding with another soft collision and what the collision vector should be if we are. So now we actually need to do the logic for moving and we'll do that inside of the bat. So make an on ready var soft collisions, soft collision, and we'll get the soft collision. And then right here, right before we move, right before we update our velocity, we can just do if soft collision dot is colliding, so we want to make sure that we're colliding, then we say velocity plus equals soft collision dot get push vector times delta, I want to make sure we're applying multiplying it by delta, and then multiply it by, by some value that will make sure that they push outside of each other. And the stronger this value, it, the higher this value is, the less likely they are to overlap at all. And now we can see if we can get these bats. You can see when they get next to each other, they don't actually ever overlap with each other. They stay outside. And we can actually, I think, it would make sense to make our soft collision shape a little bit bigger than it currently is. So they stay a little bit farther away from each other. We'll try that. Whoops. And now you can see they stay pretty far away from each other. And if we go into our player here, and we come into our hurt box, and we uncheck our layer, 
we shouldn't be able to be damaged by the bats so we can get them all overlapping with each other and see that in action. See, they do chase the player and they do push away from each other. Now this system is, it's not, it's not really the most, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend using this system if you're gonna have hundreds of enemies on the screen at the same time. However, I did do a little bit of testing myself to see, and if you duplicate a bunch of these, I wanna show you this because I feel like this is really useful, right? We get a ton of bats on the screen at once. I don't know how many this is. Right, but maybe you want a game that has quite a bit of bats. Okay. And save and run the game. You can see that it seems to work okay. Right? We're not getting huge frame drops here. And it, so it can handle quite a few different enemies, at least if you're targeting PC. If you're targeting mobile, you might want to come up with a different, more optimized system. And there are ways that you could slightly optimize this by setting a timer, potentially, so it doesn't check the collision every single frame, and other things like that. You could look into using a Boyd's system, uh, because Boyd's are a pretty common way to handle this. And this is similar to a system like that. But let's actually look at our performance because I want to show you guys how to do that. So if we run the game, I'm going to move the game, come down into debugger. And if we come into our profile, if we come into monitors, we can monitor our frame rate here. And you can see we're holding a strong 60 frames per second here. It's interesting. In my other one, it actually shows... And I'm gonna, on the other screen, I'm actually gonna attack the bats, hit them. Okay. We dropped down to 58 per, for a second there, but it's pretty much holding strong at 60. So you can also come over to your profiler, and if you were trying to determine like let's say you were having big frame drops and stuff like that and you wanted to determine where that was happening, you would use the profiler for this. So what you do for the profiler is you start right here and it profiles the game for a little bit while like this. And then you would, and you could choose which things you wanted to profile here. You can see our git push vector is included in here. And then you would stop and you would get data and you can go to any frame here and you can actually look to see what functions and what areas are costing the most amount of time. So you can see that our, let's see if we can find, here's our git push vector right here and is colliding. You can see that they are having a lot of calls right here but we're, we're still doing okay with our, with our total time here. So this is, if you were having big issues with optimization, this is where you would figure out why and where that is happening. So like, what if we turned off the physics frame and we said, okay, let's check our git, git push vector and see, you'll, you'll obviously see that um, if we start this here and we have a whole bunch of enemies, we're going to get a lot of stuff, but then over here on the left, I'm going to kill the enemies. And it's going to drop down because we're not going to have as many things actually attacking. Well, it didn't seem to make too much of a difference, actually. So, well, it's not even calling it at all now, I don't think. Let's see. Oh, it did go up a little bit there. Obviously, I had, I had, I killed all the bats and then made these two start interacting with each other again. When I move the screen, we get drops. That's interesting that moving this around gives us a frame drop, but that's probably normal. Anyways, this profiler is how you would determine where you're having issues in your game. Actually, this is less time, I think, that it's taking to call those functions. 
I understand this properly. I do wish there was some sort of an indicator over here on the side as to what these actually mean. Like, is this how many calls there are? What, what, what is this number here? I'm not actually sure now that I'm looking at it. It makes a lot more sense with the frame time. I'm guessing this is the milliseconds. Yeah, it's up here. Frame time in seconds right here. So that's what this is showing right here. Anyways, there you learned about monitoring so you can monitor your frame rate and stuff and your process, your physics process. You can see where things, what is taking time and you learned about your profiler so you can actually go in and profile those things. We're gonna get rid of a bunch of these bats. We do not need this many bats. And we'll move, we'll move this one. Oops, back into world. Move this one over just a little bit so it's not, so it doesn't attack us. Somebody mentioned that. They're like, you should move that bat so it doesn't attack you every time you start the game. But yeah, now we've got a good system set up for our bats so that we can handle overlap. And it does pretty well handling a lot of enemies on the screen. And that's gonna be it for this video. Let me make sure that we set our player's hurt box back to be the proper collision layer. That way we can take damage from the bats again. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, it's made possible. Well, if you don't know who is made possible by, at this point, 19 videos in, uh, you should already know. And if you're interested in my 1-Bit Gado course, you can check that out. There'll be a link in the description, a link at the end of this video. I appreciate all your support. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, subscribe to my channel, and I will talk to you all later.